Keep your Bible open to Acts for a while. Until further notice, just go on and keep it there. We're going to look at Acts, the first chapter today. I'm going to read the fourth verse through the fifth, and then we're going to skip to the eighth for time. And I'm just telling you today, I, I hope that uh, you'd open your heart to this word. It is a word that doesn't get preached much today, and I, yet I believe it holds the key to so many important things. It spoke to me this week, and it's my dear prayer that it speaks to you. How many people are ready to receive God's Word? Let me hear you say, oh yeah. Let's look at God's Word real quick. Acts 1, 4 through 5 and verse 8. It says, being assembled with them, this is Jesus, okay? He commanded them, do not depart for Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Look at verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We've started last week a series entitled Empowered, Becoming Like the Church of Acts. Uh, today, I want to talk to you on a thought that has really spoke to me this week, and it, it's probably going to, you're going to hear the title and go, what in the world does that have to do with what you just read? But I really want to talk to you about 24 minutes of slaughter. 24 minutes of slaughter. How many would be willing to stretch their hands this way and ask God to anoint this poor old little guy today? Can you do that? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I believe so strongly what I'm about to preach. Help me, God, to do it justice. Let there be an anointing in this house, God, and let it speak to some people. All I'm asking, God, is to put a seed in some, God, and harvest it in others. I just pray, Lord, that your anointing be in this house, and we give you glory, and we give you honor. And all of God's children said very loudly, God bless you, you can be seated. I'm about to ask you to do something that no pastor has ever done before, and no pastor probably will ever again. I'm going to get you to write down a dirty word in church. You ready? You got your pen out? It's wait. We don't like that word, do we? It's a word that Americans do not like to hear. If you can't wait to buy something, that's okay. Here's a credit card. Go buy it. Waiting for tables bother you? Here's call-ahead seating, so we'll cut that in half for you. Waiting on a pizza? I tell you what, we're going to make it that if you don't get it in 30 minutes, we're going to buy it for you. Thank you, Papa John. Appreciate that. You're taking care of us. Nobody likes to wait. If I'm confessing to you, I'm not the best sometimes at waiting. But, you know, the problem is that's eked into the church. Before, you know, we, we, we get to the point we can't receive the things from God because the things from God are not like a Burger King hamburger. They don't come right now right the way I want it to. A lot of times with the things of God, we have to wait for them. We have to seek for them. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Sometimes it just doesn't happen right away. You ever have caught somebody who was asleep at, the, at their house or taking a nap and it took more than one knock? Sometimes it took ringing the doorbell five and six times and banging that big old giant um, um, door banger on the door. I forgot what it's called, but you know what I'm talking about. You know, it takes them a minute to come there. We've lost that. We've lost that. Pastors have lost that. We know that by inner diets, don't we? If we don't see uh, rewards right away, we're quick to give up. If it doesn't come easy for us, we give up. Young people trying out for a sports team, if we don't get it the first year, we give up. But Jesus, before he sends into heaven, he tells his church to do one thing. Wait. Notice that. Not preach, not sing, not fast, not study. He tells them to do one thing, wait. Now, there was a simple reason for this. He, he, he said, you know, the, you, you're going on a dangerous mission. Death might be involved. There's going to be evil forces involved, Pharisees, Romans, and you're going to be facing a lot, and I need you to wait on the power of the Holy Spirit before you do your thing. Think about this for just a second. When think, it, it was a dangerous mission. And with thinking of dangerous missions, one mission always comes to my mind, and that's D-Day. But more specifically, at Omaha Beach. That day, there were several drop points. I believe there was a total of four, no more than five. I can't remember. My mind's escaping me. 
Omaha was the most famous of them because it would turn out to be the one of the most brutal days and one of the most bloodiest battles and one of the most bloodiest war the world had ever seen. It's the Battle of Omaha made famous by the movie Saving Private Ryan. Anybody seen that movie, Saving Private Ryan? See, a lot of people haven't, and I need you to grasp that and see that today. You see, during the beginning of Saving Private Ryan, unless you're willing to watch 24 minutes of stomach-churning slaughter, don't watch it. In fact, in 1999, I tried to show my mom the movie. She made it through eight minutes. She couldn't handle it. Director Steven Spielberg reproduces one of the most bloodiest moments in the bloodiest war in history. See, now, I, I, before, I got a little video I want to show you. But before we put it on, I need you to hear me today. I toiled over this. We took some clips of Saving Private Ryan, and we took out the gore. We took out the blood. There is some war violence, especially the first 10 seconds. So what I'm asking, if for some reason there's a child in here, that is not um, in children's church. Just have them look down for the first 10 seconds. If war violence might bother you, it's not bad, especially in the first 10 seconds. It's about the, the worst of it. If that bothers you, just focus on me. If you served in our military in this country, where there's no sound, I just want those who haven't seen it to understand what we're talking about. And before I get them to show it, let me explain it to you. These guys were coming onto the beach. And they were taking France back from the Germans. But Omaha would be different. You see, the other checkpoints, the artillery worked for them from the naval, the, uh, the naval ships. I mean, they would pound these places, and it, was e it wasn't easy, but it was much easier taking those beaches. There was a problem at Omaha. At Omaha, the artillery didn't work very well. As a matter of fact, it was almost non-existent. The bunkers were too deep. They were ineffective. Half the tanks that were trying to get on the beach sunk in the ocean. Not only that, you'll see on, uh, on the screen in just a second, they had dragon's teeth or tank traps. So these guys were just sent to take this beach. Do you know how they took this beach? They took it by just literally sending men, wave after wave, getting slaughtered until five of each company might make it and then they formed a little force. So I want you to watch this video for just a second. Again, I've given you a precursor. Now, I, I wanted this to, it, it's very important, so I wanted to show this. So let's see if they got it ready. If not, we're good? No? Here we go, good. It, focus on me. So these are these, these uh, vessels coming, and it's a, you might say, Brother Donnie, what in the world does this have to do with church? I'm going to tie it in for you for just a second. But this is literally what happened. These are MG42s, the 30 caliber machine guns that just you'll see set up, and it just was a, a shooting fish in a barrel. This is literally one of the most difficult slaughters in all of American history. Although that we carried the day, I want you to hear me when I tell you 15 times the casualties as the nearest beach occurred this day. It was a slaughter. They would come on beach, and this is what they would do. And bullets would be going everywhere. Our enemy artillery would be going everywhere. Some people would fall off in the water, and because of their packs, would be drugged down to the bottom of the ocean, and they would drown. It was a terrible, terrible thing. Now, please understand that I, I, I'm trying to make a point to you, and I think we've got the picture now, so we can go on and just shut that off and just listen to me for a second. They, they'd hide behind these things, and they were tempted to stop, but then they would just keep on moving. But Jesus, want, he said before... I go into heaven, I want you to wait. Do you know why he wanted them to wait? He wanted them to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. He knew what they were facing, and he did not want Jerusalem to be, back off that for just a second, they didn't want Jerusalem to be an Omaha moment. Where God's releasing carpenters and God's releasing, I'm sorry, fishermen and zealots and tax collectors out to face Pharisees who know more about the law. Go out to face the Romans who'd rather feed them to lions than crucify them. To get out and do these things. Jesus did not want to send his people out into Jerusalem and let it be a slaughter and let it be like the, the first 24 minutes of saving Private Ryan and watch his church being mowed down. Instead, he wanted to send them with the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what happens when they left with the power of the Holy Spirit? The Bible tells me that they preached such a message in Samaria that joy filled the whole city about what God was doing. I'm talking about fishermen. Ordinary people, zealots, tax collectors, people that Jesus got ribbed for spending time with. 
When they got up and just be ordinary people and begin to do things, not only did the Bible say Samaria was filled with joy, I love the one part where a magician wops out, pops out his wallet and says, I'll give you whatever you want if you'll let me buy in a franchise on this thing. Because what God was doing was taken away from his business. I, I love the part, not only did they do that, but you, you start seeing where Judea was all one from one miracle. One miracle. And we get in our mind that these people committed miracles every day. But it wasn't. It was somebody that said, let the power of the Holy Spirit lead me. Let me call upon God to do the supernatural. And the God began to show up and do awesome things. Now, here's the problem. Let's put this up. The problem today is the church finds itself living the 24 minutes of Saving Private Ryan because we're bent on doing something that the first church wasn't willing to do. And that's doing it without the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on, somebody. This is like a funeral in here. Uh, amen. I don't expect you to jump up and down, but my Lord, help me a little bit, okay? Hear me today. We're willing to do it without the Holy Spirit. We're willing to go forward. I don't know what went wrong in churches in America because it's not happening in all across the world. But in America, we've made up our mind, let's, let's just take it on our own. We don't need the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't need the power of God. Jesus made it important to tell us to wait, but we're trying to do it on our own. Pastors are trying to do it on their own. Churches are trying to do it on their own. Young people are trying to do it on their own. But can I tell you, when I try to do it on my own, I only have my abilities. But when I get to the point where I say, God, I don't expect to get up on this big wall out here and preach hellfire and brimstone, but God, I believe that you can do the supernatural. I want the Holy Spirit to move in me, to move through me, and God do something powerful. I believe that it is time, church, for us to stop being like the first church and charging out and trying to do it on our own when we know that the power of the Holy Ghost can and will do things. Now, here's the issue. We've listened to some lies today that would have you believe that this was just for the apostles. If I had about 15 minutes and in a couple of weeks, I'm going to prove to you that's not the truth. You can go simply to Acts chapter 2 when Peter says this is for you and every generation after you. The problem is, and somebody explained it to me, where do we get as a today's church? We have no problem believing that God put every animal on one big boat and said, let's go. I can believe that. I have no problem trying to believe that three Hebrew boys didn't burn up in fire. I have no problem trying to believe that Jesus walked on water or fed multitudes. We believe in a supernatural God, but when it comes from a supernatural God fulfilling his word and moving in earthly vessels, which he started in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Isaiah and propelled it into Joel, moved it into Acts, confirmed it in Corinthians, spoke about it in the epistles, where have we gotten that we do not think the God that we serve can do the supernatural. But all I want is somebody who's ever seen a miracle through the Holy Spirit. I want you to put your hands together right now. If you've ever seen a miracle for the Holy Ghost to move, they want you to believe it's dead. So why, church, are we trying to fight this battle on our own? As a pastor, if I tried to wow you with my words, I'd be dead on that beach. If the church, you know, we're looking out at this church today and we feel like we should be doing so much better, but the truth of it is we're being slaughtered in America because the church is fighting it on our own. We're getting out petitioned. How about this? 2% of the America's population has completely flipped the political agenda in America while the church in its lofty percentage has gone out to fight by itself. We're trying to witness by ourselves. We're trying to pray it through by ourselves. We're trying to raise our children by ourselves. We're trying to witness by ourselves. We're trying to make it through daily life by ourselves. But you can believe what you want, but I still believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he said, in the last days, the last days, not 2,000 years before the last days, but in the last days, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. I'm telling you, you don't have to be church of God. You don't have to be Pentecostal to believe for the spirit of God to lead God's people. But maybe why Americans' church is dying where more Christians don't believe in hell than do believe in hell, where we're losing our doctrine, where we're losing our faithfulness, where we're losing the things that once made us great is because we're charging the battlefield without the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're finding ourselves slaughtered on the beach. 
Oh, somebody's going to point to me that the big numbers that other churches are, are, are running, and that's fine. But if you believe that every person in every church is making it to heaven, you don't believe in the Bible, friend. It's not about, oh, God, we're getting off on the wrong foot. Let me move on here, okay? Something God's been dealing with me about. We have got to put the power of the Holy Spirit back in the church. I'm not, I'm not talking about goofiness. I'm not talking about emotion. I'm not talking about a goosebump. We're going to do it and do it according to Scripture. We're going to stay in Scripture. But I'm just telling you, either you believe the Word of God, friend, or you don't. Did God say, you know, after 2,000 years, don't quench the Spirit? Or did He say to just period, don't quench the Spirit? It's either you believe what you're reading. If people have you believe, it's only Acts chapter 2. But if you will look up and read, it is dealt with quite often in the epistles. Why do I believe on it before we move on? Because I used to be a young person that did not believe in it. I'm going to be honest with you. Didn't believe in it. Wanted to be a part of a denomination where it was far, 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 far away from me. And that's okay if that's you today. I'm telling you where I was. Couldn't preach my way out of a wet paper bag. Now I can finally make my nose out of it, but that's okay. I, I, I struggled. I tried. I couldn't get my tongue corrected. I kept trying to go back to my old way of life. But one day when I began to just kind of get past my fear and I saw the power of what God was doing, something grabbed me and got a hold of me and filled me. And you know what it did? It empowered me to change. So, yes, I'm still on the battlefield, but I'm not laying down on the ground waiting for the bullets to be done. I'm getting up and keep on fighting the fight. I've been empowered by the anointing of Jesus Christ, and I'm thankful for it because if I I'm being honest with you, I'm the least of the least. But with God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You've got to wake up, church, and get off the beach. Get off the battlefield and say, God, I've wandered off for too long. Let the power of God rain down in my life, on my job, in my family, and in my country. I don't want to live the 24 minutes of slaughter. So let's look at three things that we, we've got to stop. Three things that we've got to stop to avoid an Omaha moment, to avoid 24 minutes of slaughter. What are we going to get past? To avoid this moment where the church is just being plastered on the beach. This may, you might say, Brother Diane, I just don't get it. Well, when you know the more churches close each year than open in America, you get it. When you realize not only do Americans not believe in uh, hell anymore, American Christians I think it was like, what, 70%, 66% somewhere? That means two out of three in this building don't believe that there's really a place called hell and punishment. I'm telling you, it's because we've tried to push the message without the power. God felt it necessary to give up, what was it, 120 days? I can't remember. Uh, God felt it necessary to wait that long. But we're ready to just go out and do it. We're going to do our program without praying. That's why we need Operation Andrew for you to be here to pray. We need the Holy Ghost to help us. And hear me, I'm not saying it's all about tongues. I'm, not saying, I'm just saying the Holy Spirit. The Bible says if any two gathered in his name, he's right there. We need the Holy Spirit. So the first thing we need to rem remember to, to stop, stop fighting without the artillery. Now, what, what made this a home all moment and such a slaughter what was simply this, that these guys charged, put up that next slide, they charged without artillery. Why so many died at Omaha Beach that did not die at Normandy or these others because they did not have the power of the artillery. See, the artillery would bombard where they were going. So they would weaken. Not only were they weakened, but it gave them support to advance. Omaha did not have the support, so they found in Saving Private Ryan 24 minutes of slaughter. The problem today is, church, is like I said, we're going on without the artillery, without the power. Without God moving in our lives, do you understand? Forget the church. How many of us are trying to deal with issues with our children, in our marriage, on our job, with our addictions, with our health? And nine times out of ten, we do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't get together and say, Holy Ghost, move in me and help me. Spirit, help me and encourage me and charge me and lift me up. We just go on and what do we do? We charge Omaha. And what's happened? We're finding 24 minutes of slaughter. We go on without the artillery. Do you know what that caused? It caused for this army to be just dug in, just stuck. You saw in that video there, hiding behind the dragon's teeth, the, the, the tank traps. Not big, but they, they were scared to move out because these guys could continue fire because their artillery wasn't effective. And I can't speak for you, but I have found that way in my life where I have found myself bogged down and I don't feel like I'm making progress. 
I don't feel like I'm making moving. I, I just feel like I'm just bogged down by the attacks of the enemy. Anybody ever felt that way? And maybe we're doing it because we don't have artillery. And you say, Brother Donnie, I, I appreciate the, the, the connection, but what in the world does the Holy Spirit have to do with artillery? Glad you asked, friend, because what did he say in verse 8? Jesus said this, but you shall receive, somebody say it, power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The word power comes from the Greek word dunamis. Does that word sound familiar? It should. It's where we get the word dynamite from. It means explosive. It means powerful. He says, you shall become people of power. See, the thing of it is, we get in our mind that we can't do these things, but it never occurred to us, it's not us doing them to begin with. Can I tell you, there have been times, and this is just, if little old Donnie can do it, little old Donnie who struggled, who's, who's, who's the least of anybody in this building can do it, my friend, you've got to understand you can do it because it's not about the vessel, it's what's being poured in the vessel. And I'm just telling you, I can't remember the time I was eating it out back and a woman just walked right by me and stopped. I've never seen her before and said, there's something different about you. You're, you're a pastor. You're a Christian, aren't you? Do you think that's me? I was wearing slacks and a hoodie. I looked like I was you know, going to be in a gangster rap battle before I was looking like I was going to take the pulpit. But what was it? It was the power of the Holy Spirit doing what I couldn't do. While I was engulfing some cheese fries, the Holy Spirit done made its way and got a hold of some people. Can I tell you, that's what the power of God can do? You might look at yourself and say, I'm just the least of leaf. Well, can I tell you, if you can beat a hooded guy eating cheese fries, then I'd like to see that. But that's what the power of the Holy Ghost can do. I'm sitting here in my inabilities trying to preach a sermon to you, but it's reaching some of your hearts, not because I'm eloquent, not because I'm creative, because the power of the Holy Spirit is willing to operate in any vessel. And it's time for us, church, to realize this works not just for the pastor, but for the parent, for the boss, for the businessman, for the believer. It is time for us to wake up and say, God, send me the power of the Holy Spirit. Because this is what's bothering me, okay? This is what's bothering and what's concerning me. I'm jealous. I've said it. I'm jealous. And let me tell you what I'm jealous about. I'm tired of watching Facebook videos of what God is doing all over this world, and we're too busy to be a part of it. Let me tell you what I saw this week on a, on a news station. Indonesia, which is a Muslim country. Do you know what happens in a Muslim country when you try to preach Christianity? A Muslim country that did not know Christ. Somebody showed, you know, it talked about how in the past people tried to come and witness here and it never took. This is news. Never took. It wouldn't. Now, I'm not trying to elevate a denomination. I don't even think it is a denomination. But these people showed up in Indonesia starting to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. Letting the Holy Spirit begin to touch people, begin to heal people. Do you now know that 30% of all Indonesia are charismatic believers in God? Not believers, but the power of the Holy Spirit. I saw in this newscast, it bothered me because they're worshiping, they're jumping up and down, and we sit here with the best music money can buy, the best talent that God can bless us with, and if we feel good, and if the moon's aligned just right, we might lift up a hallelujah, and these people are getting after it with tambourines and nothing. But do you know what I saw? I saw they said, why do you go to church here? He said, I'll tell you what, I had cancer in my back. Now, this ain't some religion. This is some Indonesian. I had cancer in my back. And one of my friends said, why don't you try Jesus? I came to the church. Not only did God heal me, I'm still here. And every one of my family is saved to this day. That's why the gospel's struggling. Because the people of God don't want to get wacky. We're scared of letting God move. Well, if you don't like it now, you better not go to heaven. Because it's filled with the supernatural. It's filled with the Holy Spirit. It's filled with great worship. It's filled with dancing. It's it's filled with shouting. It's filled with angels. It's time to say, God, bring the artillery. Do it in your life, friend. You ain't got to get wacky. And I'm going to tell you this. As your pastor and brother Brian, if somebody gets out of order and wacky, we're going to deal with it. But my goodness, you know how long it's been since I've had to correct somebody because they got too zealous? Somebody make me do it. My goodness. We're so dignified, and we just love Jesus a certain way. And it'd be good for somebody to get out one day and just celebrate God. And I have to come to you and say, man, buddy, I appreciate that, but I've been preaching now 10 minutes. You're going to have to calm down the dancing. I want to see God do something. 
Because the problem is we've been trying to let people hear our words and nobody feel our God. But I make up my mind, I'm telling you, it's time to stop floundering on that beach. The same Holy Spirit that started the first church is the same Holy Spirit that's here. It's the same one that got me off drugs, got me off the bottle, took me from a homeless young man and did what he's done in my life today. I'm not ashamed of the Holy Spirit. I don't mind telling you I'm a tongue talker. I don't mind telling you I dance by myself time. I might flip, I might twirl. I sing even though I can't sing and I shout even though things aren't going my way. That's because the external factors can't stop the power of the Holy Spirit that's moving in my heart, that's moving in my soul. God, allow yourself to move. Embrace it because our kids don't know it. Embrace it because our kids don't see it. Before I move on, here's the problem. The problem today is this. We have tried our best to be witnesses for God. And what we've done is this. Look at me before we write this down. We've tried to be witnesses. We go to people and say, accept Jesus or go to hell. Because we think we're the witness. I'm going to show you something. Unless you understand that the Holy Spirit is the primary witness and we're just secondary witnesses, you're going to find yourself in a slaughter doing the Great Commission. Now hear me. Some of you might say, I, I don't get that, Brother Diane. That don't make sense. Let's look at verse 8 again before we move on. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now look at this. And you shall be my witnesses. Not you are my witnesses. They already witnessed him being resurrected, right? So technically they can witness to that, but they're not technically his witnesses the way he intended until the Holy Spirit is operating in their life. Let me just stop right here and tell you, you're not the witness, friend. The Holy Spirit living inside you is the witness. You don't have to be Pentecostal to grab that. There are good Baptist people in this building today. You've got the Holy Spirit living in you, guiding you and operating. That's awesome. It's not about a denomination. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit movement. And we've been trying to witness acting like we're the primary witness, but the Holy Spirit is the primary witness. Let's give God glory and honor. Let's go to point number two. I'll make these quicker. Point number two is stop fighting the wrong mission. Stop fighting the wrong mission. Anybody here ever found themselves? I have. Living the first 24 minutes of Saving Private Ryan, it just seems like the enemy is just bogging you down. He's attacking you left and right. You're not walking out in the full power of God. You're ducked down behind something saying, when's this storm going to end? Anybody ever experienced that? Is that just me? Because if I'm the only one, somebody else come preach this, and I'll sit down and amen you, because I must not be doing something right. You ever found yourself, no matter what the pastor says, no matter how he preaches, your marriage is still kind of struggling a little bit? No matter how hard he preaches, your finances just ain't quite right? It didn't work out just that simple? You found yourself. See, what happened on Omaha what was different on Omaha is just, you know, they couldn't get the artillery to work. But on the other beaches, let's look at Normandy. Normandy, they, they would rain down, and they said, this is where we're going to hit. So you're able to push forward while that artillery is hitting. Can you imagine what would have happened if somebody, let's say like me, all right, we're going to go take this. This is where the artillery, this is where the master, this is where the general said go. I'm going over here. I like this beach better. What would have happened? Wouldn't have turned out well, would it? Hear me. They had to go forward. They couldn't turn left or couldn't turn right. They had to go where the artillery was. See, here, here's the thing, church. While we're struggling and we're having an Omaha Beach moment, because God is saying, to, back off of that, I, I, I got you. While, while we're having an Omaha Beach moment is while we're going up on the stage, that's where God wants us to be. And he's saying, move Preach the Great Commission. Let me use you. If you would just let me do things. You have no idea the great things I'm going to do in your life. We go, yeah, but I really want a promotion. Oh, oh, God, help me on my promotion. Please, God, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus, give me my promotion. I need money to buy a new jet ski. Oh, God, we come into church service. It's not about the lost. God, give me a goosebump today. I want to feel good. Make it about me. Let me feel you. Let me shout. I, I know you're calling me up there to minister to others, but I'm just going to get over here and kind of do my own thing. God, just get with me. We worry about our own desires, our own feelings, and our own mission. And the reason why we have an Omaha uh, moment is because of this. Because we try to persuade God to join our mission instead of us joining his. 
Can I remind you that you're empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, that you can tear down any high thing, that God has made you more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. But that only works when you stick to the battle plan. The reason why some of us might be facing a Omaha moment is because we've been trying to build our own kingdom. We've been trying to go after our own mission. We've been trying to get rich, but that's not what the gospel says. We've been trying to go and make sure everything works out in my life, but that's not what the gospel says. We've been trying to make sure that all our needs are met, but that's not what the gospel's about. We've been trying to persuade God to come join our mission over here, and God's not going to do that. God says that's where the mission is. How many of us, friend, and I'm guilty is the next, saying, where's the artillery, God? We're nowhere near where we need to be because God could care less about your 401K because eventually that's going to be useless if God comes tomorrow, what good is that 401k? God doesn't care so much about your goose bump as he cares about your faith and your work for him. And the problem is we're saying, God, will you come over here? God, will you come over here? And he says, no, this is where the plan is. But when I begin to think about that, I want to remind you what Joshua 1 and 7 says. He looked at little old Joshua who's taken over from Moses, about to go on a dangerous mission. And he said, I want you to do one thing. Just be strong and courageous. Now look. Don't turn from the right and don't turn from the left and you will prosper in everything that you do. If you're bogged down on the beach today, if bullets are whizzing over your head, if you found yourself slaughtered, why don't you make up your mind? I'm tired of turning left about myself. I'm tired of turning right trying to build my own kingdom. But God, those steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Lead me into battle. Lead me where I need to go. Put me where I need to be and help me to fight the fight you want me to fight. Come on and give God glory and honor. The third and final thing that we have to do is keep moving. The only way, I'm sorry, stop, I'm sorry, stop fighting from the boat, my fault. The only thing we got to keep doing is to take the beach, we have to keep moving. Keep moving. When you find yourself in an Omaha moment, you may be tempted to stay in the boat. Hear me, we're about to close. Tempted to stay in the boat. But if you stay in the boat, it is certain death. We give the Apostle Peter a hard time for getting out of the boat, but he was the only one who was willing to get out. He was, but he sunk, but he got out of the boat. He's done something only one other person in the history of the world has been able to do, and that's walk on water. Might only been for five seconds, but buddy, he did it. The problem is God's going to call you out of the boat at times, friends. It ain't going to make sense. I've lived that. Everybody look at you saying what you're doing is crazy. And you know how the only sane answer you can give them is, I feel like this is what God spoke to me to do. There's a moment where you just got to keep moving. Get out of the boat. Before we say a prayer and go home today, there's some of us that's been bogged down on this beach. Some churches that have been bogged down on this beach. God's been doing some great things in this church. But if we think that this is even the skim of the top of what God can and wants to do at Christ's way, then we're in a big, 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 trouble. God's willing to do so much, to do so many great things. But the problem is when it gets difficult, do you know what we do? We start hiding behind those little metal things. Sometimes you just, you got to keep moving. When your family's under fire and it's just easier just to sit down and just say, if God's going to do it, let him do it. Sometimes you just have to keep moving. When things don't go right and they, you don't understand them, when you don't understand them, brother and sister Baker, and you, they, they, they don't make sense to you. You just got to keep up and keep moving. When the bullets of the enemy is whizzing by your head and the explosions of, uh, uh, of the enemy are going on all around you and everything in you is telling you to stop, drop, and roll, you've got to get up and keep moving. Because there's going to be times, friend, when you find yourself in the middle of a Saving Private Ryan moment. The difference is... When the enemy starts attacking you, you can ask the Holy Ghost to start attacking him. Stand with us, if you will. Let the Holy Spirit minister in the move. Let the Holy Ghost have its way. Now listen, I, I knew it was going to be, and if you don't like this one, you might not like the next couple. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to preach Sunday. I've got a couple in the hopper I'm praying about. But God's been dealing with me about the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I'm just telling you, when I see the revival that's taking place and I'm reading articles of dead people raised, I love the one specific one from the revival that God did. I believe it was in the turn of the century right there. Where a little old poor town, I believe it was in Brazil. Dirt poor. True story. Somebody came and started preaching the power of God and the power of God started moving. The whole city got saved and before long they were having crops ten times the size of normal normal people around them. God blessed that community in such a way that they just hired like a fleet at the time of that article of about 50 Mercedes. Oh, third world country down there, a little old village. Mercedes trucks to deliver all the produce that God was giving them. See, here's the thing. You might say, Brother, I understand. Why do you want me to do the Holy Spirit and I get off my own plan? Because the Bible's very clear. Seek me first and I'll add everything else that you ever need. I'll give you the desires of your heart. Now listen, I don't know where I'm going to go with this altar call right now and I've got to be honest with you. I'm going to ask God to speak to me. I know it's not for everybody. I don't want anybody ducking your head if it's not for you. You've got to pray with it. Let me tell you what I believe. Sir. I believe those that are baptized with the Holy Spirit and those who are not deserve the same amount of respect. It is a gift. It does not mean it is a requirement or a necessity. I do believe it will change your life. I do believe that God will give it to everybody. But I'm telling you that we're all equal in here. If you've been raised in a different denomination and you love Jesus, you love God, nobody looks down on you. Don't you lower your head. But I'm telling you, the power of the Holy Spirit could change your life firsthand. It touched me when I wasn't in church. It's helped me in ways I'll, you'll never understand. But I want to speak to those for just a second who want to pray with me. That either A, you're on the battlefield and bullets are going right after you. You find yourself bogged down and you need God to help you through and God to touch you. But I also want to speak to those that maybe this sermon has kind of touched your heart a little and spoke to you and said, maybe I have been fighting without the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe I haven't got along like I should with God and say, God, operate in me. If you can use an ordinary fisherman, if you think these people could preach, they couldn't. I told you a couple weeks ago what they said about Paul. He said, I didn't come with you with fancy words, but what did he say? A demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to ask one question before I do give my altar call. Anybody in this building ever seen a miracle in church? I mean a miracle from the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to see your hands high. Now, a miracle can only be explained by God. That means somebody being healed of cancer. That means somebody's uh, limb getting fixed, that blind eyes being opened. I'm telling you, God can still do those things. If this has spoke to anybody, like it's kind of spoke to me, I'm not going to pray with you today. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to ask anybody, if it's five of us, we'll pray together. The Holy Spirit's kind of pricks your heart. I'm not being the soldier I could be. And why am I finding myself in the sand when I could be finding myself standing on the rock? If that's you today, any one of those needs meet you. And you might say, Brother Donnie, I just feel like I need to find the power of the Holy Spirit for myself. It might just something God's dealing with me now and I'm already praying about it. Maybe I've got it and I haven't been using it like I should, but I'm ready for the power of the Holy Spirit to be in me and in my church. If that's you, will you just come forward and pray with me? I, can I get y'all to do that? That's okay. I, brother, I, I promise you, this is just three of us. We're going to pray. This is something God's been dealing with me on strongly. We find ourselves on the ground, on the mat, because we're not allowing the power of the Holy spirit to flow like we should oh god we thank you today we thank you god put the fire in my heart maybe you don't have that gift today friend and you want god to start just speaking to you about it listen i know that this is not a popular sermon i get it i know it doesn't fit the seeker mold but i do not care i need the power of the holy spirit to do what i cannot do I want to be the best believer I can be. I want to be the best father I can be. Father, I just pray today.